It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Almost 50 million people in the United States live with some type of physical or intellectual disability. That's one in five people. Maybe you have a disability or you know someone close to you who does. If you can't think of anyone, chances are someone you know lives with an invisible disability, a condition that they experience but that isn't obvious to the naked eye. How about in religious communities? How many people there have disabilities on average? We don't know. No one tracks numbers that specific, but there are studies suggesting that some people with disabilities don't feel very welcome in religious settings. And that's what we'll be focusing on in this special episode, accepting and including people with disabilities in religious communities. It's a special episode because it features a panel of 12 scholars. It's the first time I've had that many people on the show. These are scholars and organizers who specialize in theology and disability. I recently spoke with them at the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability held at Hope College in Michigan. But before we get to the panel, we begin with a short video that the church produced about people with disabilities and belonging in religious communities. You're about to hear the audio here, but you can check the video out at disability.churchofjesuschrist.org, a website that has a lot of resources for people who are interested in disability and religion. For people with disabilities, most doors serve two purposes. They let people in and they keep people out. So the question we have to ask is, do our doors let people with disabilities in or keep them out? One in three. When people hear it, they don't believe it. That one in three households has a person with a disability. At church, you'll hear people say, but we don't have anyone with a disability in our congregation. Because if we did, we'd know who they were. Because if we did, we'd build a ramp for them. Except right now, I don't need a ramp. I just need the teacher to use a microphone. Right now, I just need a friend. Someone to pray with. Someone to tell stories to. Someone to bond with over our faith. But how can you bond when you're invisible? Hiding in plain sight. Those without sight. The hard of hearing. Those with depression, autism, anxiety. Those who have a hard time fitting in. Those with fragile bodies who try hard but struggle. I just need you to believe. Believe in me. To believe this place would be better with me by your side. Have you ever really thought about the things that make you belong? Truly belong in a community? It's hard to describe exactly what they are, but you definitely know when you don't fit in. People talk all the time about special needs, but these are not special needs. They're everybody's needs. We just want to be invited noticed, loved. And that manifestation of love doesn't have to be anything big. Sometimes the simplest things are the most meaningful. After all, faith isn't about programs. It is about relationships. And reaching out doesn't require the extraordinary, just a regular outpouring of the ordinary. We can share. We can serve. We can contribute. We can help. We're believers, just like you. And just like you, we can listen. We can comfort. We can offer all of our support. For people with disabilities, most doors serve two purposes. But the doors here should only have one. And now to the panel. We're talking with 12 scholars from around the world and from different religious traditions about how we can create a spirit of belonging for everyone, including people with disabilities, in our religious communities. 
Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me, Blair Hodges, at mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe wherever good podcasts are available and take a moment to rate and review the show. That helps us get the word out about what we're doing here at the Maxwell Institute. We also strive to make the podcast as accessible as possible. You can read a full transcript on our website at mi.byu.edu slash mipodcast. All right, let's dive in. I'm Blair Hodges from Brigham Young University's Maxwell Institute podcast, and I'm here in Holland, Michigan, with a distinguished panel of guests at the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability. The Summer Institute brings people from many different religious backgrounds together to talk about people with disabilities, specifically to ask what gifts, needs, and contributions that they and their families bring to our faith communities. I want to begin with a very large panel by having everybody introduce themselves. So we're going to go around the ring here, and people are going to tell us who they are and what brought them to study disabilities and religion. So we'll start with you. I'm Devin Stahl. Um, I'm a professor at Baylor University. I teach ethics, and I'm a person with a disability. Um, which I discovered in seminary at a sort of pivotal point in my formation um, and became very interested then in, in everything disability theology had to offer. All right, thank you. My name is Muno Chirubamavi. I come from Zimbabwe. I'm the executive director of To Love a Child Zimbabwe. It's an organization that tries to respond to the needs of children with disabilities and work with caregivers. I'm also a pastor with a Baptist church and uh, a theological educator with a number of seminaries and universities in Zimbabwe. And what made you get interested in religion and disability together? The needs that are in the community and the gap that we have been seeing where no one else was making a contribution and we thought as a church we need to respond and respond appropriately and informatively. Thank you. All right, next. Neil Cudney, I'm the Director uh, of Organizational and Spiritual Life for Christian Horizons, which is a, a large Christian faith-based organization that supports people with disabilities in Canada and in four countries around the world. My entry into this conversation, again, is very personal. I was identified as a person having a significant learning disability uh, very early on uh, in my career. Or, educational career, uh, a significant form of dyslexia, which made for a very interesting journey. And also my adopted brother uh, has fetal alcohol syndrome. And then what was the kind of the final entry into this was I needed a job in 1987. And I joined this organization called Christian Horizons, which was supposed to be a temporary stopgap. And I'm still here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Katie Steed, I'm the Disability Specialist Manager for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I've always loved people with disabilities and enjoyed working with them. And when I was in grad school, I really dawned on me how much quality of life we gain from our faith. And I wanted to do more so that my faith could be more accommodating to people accessing it that had a disability. I am Reverend Christopher Rajkumar from the Indian Disability Ecumenical Accompaniment. We basically work with churches, facilitating the churches to work on inclusion and accessibility on four areas that we work. One is networking the theologically trained persons with disabilities and networking the caregiving organizations, which are church-based, doing disability theology, and finally working on accessible and inclusive church. There is an another component got into that is interfaith response to disability, that is inclusion and accessibility. Thank you for being here. All right, next. My name's Andy Calder. I'm with the Uniting Church in Australia, and um, my job is disability inclusion advocate, and uh, I've been a Uniting Church minister for 25 years. And what got you interested in doing disability and, and religion? Um, in 1980, I lived for a period of time in a large community in the United Kingdom, and uh, the sense of unconditional acceptance and belonging was so profound for me that uh, that propelled me on my life trajectory, largely. Well, thank you for being here, Andy. All right, next. My name is John Swinton. I'm Professor in Practical Theology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland in the UK. And how did you get interested? I spent 16 years as a mental health nurse. Uh, and then I worked for some time as a mental health chaplain. So when I kind of stumbled into academia in the early 90s, uh, I just continued to think about that in a different context, in a theological context. So it just comes out of my formation, out of my life, really. 
And I think everybody in the room could agree there's a lot of room in the academy for this kind of research, uh, yeah. a lot of work to be done. All right. My name is Topher Endress, and I'm a current PhD student at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, and I became interested in disability and theology, in particular after doing ministry for and with people with disabilities and finding very few resources that I felt were appropriate and uh, considerate of their full humanity. And so I felt like that couldn't be right. Uh, the more I discovered it was right, that was all that was available. So I jumped into academia to help be part of a solution for that. And what was your faith background? Uh, largely just Protestant. All right, thank you. I'm Jill Harshaw, I'm from Ireland, where I teach at Queen's University in practical and disability theology. My passion for that issue is very personal in that I have a daughter who's now 34 years old who has profound and complex intellectual and physical disabilities. I'm Shelley Christensen. I started working in this field 18 years ago and started a brand new program in the Minneapolis Jewish community to work with congregations and faith-based organizations there to raise awareness and to help create pathways so people with disabilities could feel that they belong. Since then, I have become a speaker. I am an author. My new book, From Longing to Belonging, has just been published. And my point of entry into this field is a direct result of raising a son, Jacob, with Asperger's syndrome and realizing that his ease as being a member of our congregation, our synagogue as a child, as a teen, and also as an adult was very uncommon. And that just fueled the passion that I have for justice, fairness, and for people to be able to live the kinds of lives that they want to live. My name is Barbara Newman, and I work for an organization called All Belong, Center for Inclusive Education. I am the director of support services for congregations. One of the things that got me into this as a special education teacher, we had students who were included for seven hours a day at Zealand Christian School, and then those parents really struggled to find places to worship and were kicked out, uh, sent away to find another congregation. And so that really launched my opportunity to deliver supports in a variety of forms to congregations. I'm Bill Gaventa. I'm an ordained American Baptist minister, although my work over the years has gotten increasingly ecumenical and multi-faith. I'm partly in this work because I grew up overseas as a missionary kid and when i came back to the states i was the one who felt like i didn't belong anywhere but i also had a passion for pastoral care that uh, was focused on good old baptist principles social gospel and uh, when i got assigned as a pastoral care student in a hospital against my will to work in a clinic with families with kids who came there for a multidisciplinary evaluation i had to struggle with what does it mean for me to be a pastor in that setting and found there from the stories of the families who came through the lack of welcome in faith communities and have realized over the years that my helping them to find a congregational home has also partly been my own journey about helping people find home and community and i'm the director of the summer institute on theology and disability all right, so that introduces our panel here. I wanted to start by talking about a chapter in the Bible, in the Christian tradition. John chapter 9 has an interesting scene where disciples ask Jesus about a man who was born blind. They're asking a question, why was he born this way? And that kind of question hasn't gone away through the centuries. So I wanted to talk about some of the helpful and perhaps some of the less helpful ways that people answer that question theologically today. Because the stories that people with disabilities tell and that people tell about people with disabilities can have a really big impact on a community's welcoming uh, of people with disabilities. So let's start there. What are some of the ideas that you've heard theologically? Bill Gaventa, go ahead. Well, that a long time ago, a, a man who was one of my mentors said in that John passage, what Jesus did was sever the link between sin and disability because he's, the, the kind of comment was when when they asked Jesus that question, Jesus said, no, it, it wasn't a sin. Uh, it, it was not that. And he severed that. I think still too many people, when they see a person with disability, ask why, as if they don't recognize that limitation is part of all of us. And I also personally think that we ask the why question about disability because we assume it means suffering, 
which sometimes it does. And that's usually, though, at the hands of people who the most of the suffering that people with disabilities tell me about is the attitude of other people and the attitudes of other people. So I think we get involved in that question, the classic theistic question of why something's happened. And so the question is, how do we answer that about anything else? What's our answer to the why question of why my wife had a bout with cancer or why my grandmother died or whatever? So it's not a different question than lots of other issues. I think we don't give the people with disabilities the chance to answer the question why, like we do, like what's the purpose of your life and what is God calling me to do? Why am I alive? Right. I wanted to hear from Devin Stahl on that because she found out that she had a disability while she was going through school. So did you undergo any changes in how you view disability and religion at that time? Yeah. I don't know that I had really ever thought about it. I was an invincible 22-year-old, so thinking about disability was not on the top of my mind. But when I was diagnosed with MS, I think a lot of what I heard was, Either it's your personal sin, which seems very anti-biblical, um, but there are still many who hold that view, or uh, the lesser of that would have been uh, it's part of original sin. It's not your particular sin, but it's the sin of the world, and that's why you are this way. I also heard it's the thing that's going to refine you and make you into the person God wants you to be, so it's sort of a test of your faithfulness in that way. I think all of those were not helpful to me. It seemed to place extra blame on me at a time that was difficult enough as I was trying to figure out who I was. It assumed that this thing was a bad thing that had happened to me, even if I hadn't been experiencing it that way. So I think the kind of explanations tended to make people feel better about being in communion with me. They, it was the kind of explanations that made them feel better because they could explain it away, but it wasn't necessarily an explanation that was meant to help me deal with sort of this new change in my life. Yeah, sometimes I think the answers that we give to people or the ways that we respond to people help alleviate our own discomfort. Um, some of the answers that we're eager to give, I think of Job's comforters, for example, like they were ready and willing to give Job all sorts of reasons for why he was going through what he was going through, but it seemed more geared to make themselves feel comfortable with it. Like I can make sense of this. Shelley, do you, coming from the Jewish tradition um, and, and Devin coming from the Christian tradition, do you see similarities there in how people respond? The similarities that I see certainly are that the society in general sees people with disabilities as less than others. And I often just refer to Genesis 127, that we're all created in the divine image, in God's image. The important thing, I think, for us to realize and to really convey to others who are uncomfortable when they meet a person with a disability, who don't know how to say the right thing, or they think they don't know what the right thing is to say or do, is, um, I'm gonna quote my rabbi, Norman Cohen, who says, when you look into a person's eyes and you see the spark of the divine, you won't wonder how to treat them, you'll know. And I think we need to remember that because there's so much muddiness around our relationships with each other to begin with, and in the Jewish tradition, and in many other traditions, education and accomplishment is such an important factor. And so it automatically, in a community that, that doesn't understand that we all have a different path in which to live our lives, in a different purpose for each one of us, that you know, we, get, we get so caught up in Things have to be perfect. Things have to be right. And the beauty is in the imperfection. The beauty of that divine image, of being created in God's image, is in all the imperfection. It's in all the uniqueness that we each have. Shelley, that brings the point that there are a lot of different kinds of disabilities. There are disabilities that deal with hearing. There are disabilities that deal with sight, with mobility, and intellectual disabilities. And all of these can have different ramifications. Um, John Swinton has written about intellectual disabilities. You've worked with intellectual disabilities. I'm interested to hear your thoughts at this point. Well, it strikes me on the question you're asking about uh, disability and saying that the, uh, there's a tendency to engage in what you might call lazy theodicy. So you have something that's different, and you go to you make up an explanation why how a good God could do this thing, and it's just laziness because you don't bother to think about the issues, you don't think about, think, think about what the scriptures have to say. You just describe this label, and you say, "Well, that's fine. I can stand back now. I've got an explanation. I can uh, then pray for you or whatever it is." But it seems to me that the Apostle Paul is really clear that 
everybody has sinned and fallen short of the goodness of God and of the glory of God, and that everybody will be transformed in the resurrection. Uh, the mark of the body of Christ is diversity, not homo homogeneity. So why is it that we pick out certain forms of difference and choose to pathologize them spiritually and not other forms? And to me, that's just a human thing. That's not a God thing. Thank you. Andy Calder, you had something? I'm recalling the perspective of a previous boss of mine, Elizabeth Hastings, who lived with polio. And uh, she rather controversially made a statement one day that Jesus would have done a whole lot of greater things for people had he not healed as many people as he did, rather said to people, go be yourself as you are, live your life as fully as you can. And so that doesn't give you a theological response directly to, to that nexus, but it's the perspective of somebody who has lived with these comments coming at them all the time. And the second thing I'd say to that people may have heard of a particular uh, BBC production called The Fifth Gospel. And I did YouTube it recently, it's still in existence, but again, it highlights the perspectives of people who have been subjected to these conversations and comments about the relationship of what have you done wrong. And it's a very powerful film in that they ascribe a fifth gospel and the fifth gospel is, again, similar to what my boss Elizabeth Hastings was saying. You are whole as you are. Go and live your life healed and, um, and live it in its fullness. I just offer that as a contrast to a lot of the, um, the dialogue that goes on in the disability field. Muno Chirovamavi, you had something to add as well, please. It's interesting that uh, if that question was uh, asked in my context of Zimbabwe, informed heavily by African traditional religion. Uh, it was going to have uh, serious and interesting complications because um, the idea of causality in terms of disability is spiritualized. And by that I mean it can be attributed to different forms of the spirit world. Ancestors, avenging spirits, witchcraft, alien spirits, you name it. To the extent that it becomes very difficult to unpack which kind of spirit is responsible for causing this. Instead of generating a solution, it can actually uh, complicate the matter. And this then leads people to look for religious specialists, diviners, or traditional medical practitioners who will then be able to explain and be able to fight the problem. But half the time with the existing uh, social disparities, people then take a religious specialization in the traditional worldview to try and make a living for themselves. So they end up exploiting somebody or families that are already burdened so it makes very interesting reading, particularly from African traditional religion and culture, that, uh, that if that question was asked, it would have a, a very interesting um, uh, interpretation. Thank you. Christopher, you had something to add to that as well. Generally, the people with disabilities are seen less in every society. This is where churches and the theological fraternity to think of three questions. Uh, how does God treat people with disabilities, especially in the light of Genesis 127 in the image of God, number one? Number two, how does the scripture or how do the scriptures treat people with disabilities? So this is where the religious practices come in and they started telling this is sin, this is not sin. And this is, these are the causes, whether it is my ancestor's sin or my sin or my parents' sin. So. There is a difference in God's approach to the people with disabilities and also the scriptures approach. Then, with these two questions, the third question we pose is to know how does the worshipping places treat the people with disabilities? If they reflect God or if they represent God, is it accessible and inclusive? So, this is how. Number two, 
when it comes in terms of you know uh, healing the narrations which are talking about healing in gospels jesus mostly asked the people with the disabilities to go to the society and to show after the healing so the healing also has to be seen uh, this way this is where the john 9 comes in saying that to glorify god where the society which was practicing exclusion becomes inclusive I think one of the tricky things there is some people read the Bible as though it's telling the same story all the way through. They don't see some of the tensions that exist in the text itself. So they might look at some of the metaphors that Isaiah uses when he talks about disability in kind of sinful ways or he, or promises of the resurrection where the deaf will hear and the blind will see. It reminded me Tofer of something that you said you actually started focusing on this because you found the resources themselves to be wanting and so i'm wondering how you're reckoning with scripture when you're doing that because there are some scriptures that aren't easy to work with that that kind of have an older sensibility uh, when it comes to disabilities i think that's true but i also would say there's a tendency in a lot of christian communities to demonize and devalue old testament or hebrew bible scriptures and count them as the work of a a different god essentially that it's a god who is vengeful and doesn't care about the people of god and the communities of god um but ultimately any problematic scripture could be recast and reread in light of the other narratives that you're going to find throughout the rest of scripture and can be recontextualized through historical studies but also through the way that traditions have reinterpreted these passages over and over and so i think there needs to be some acknowledgement that Yes, there are problematic scriptures and yes, if you were to read several of these pieces out of context and with our own modern understanding of disability as broadly bad, it's easy to be convinced of your own rightness in this. But if you were to read it in a different way with a new acknowledgement that tradition is constantly being reinterpreted and scripture is always being uh, read by a community of people with a particular context and a history that they live into i think it's also just as possible to read some of those negative text and acknowledge that they don't have to purely be negative but there can be good that is exposed through that as well yeah it seems like a lot of religious communities can uh, resurrect almost scripture they can they can repurpose scripture uh, and they can understand scripture in a, in a new light there are a lot of different possibilities that are open when you read the bible uh, you can read the bible with new eyes so to speak i mean i guess that's kind of an ableist metaphor in and of itself right so we can't escape some of this stuff right so uh neil you had something yeah, that you wanted I, to add We all have assumptions when we enter into biblical texts that we bring in with us. And John 9 is one of those texts that we enter into and we see the man as an object lesson or we see the the man as some kind of way that God is using him. He's been waiting passively for all these years for Jesus to stop by. Uh, I mean that was the same problem with the disciples and we forget that this man has had an entire life uh up to this point. And there's that that line as we enter into that into John 9 is it says that as Jesus passed by he saw the man. And that's such a powerful image of Jesus stopping and in that moment of seeing the man restores to him his humanity, who he is as a beloved child of God and removes this idea that the man is this passive object. but a cared for subject of his of his care and when we enter into these relationships it's us stopping and pausing and seeing the person first when we enter into that conversation when we enter in to that dialogue uh and we never can objectify people in those experiences we've got to be bringing the image back to Yeah, Genesis 127. This is a person created in the image of God. I think this is the value of interfaith discussion about these issues because one thing that Jewish readers of the New Testament have called my attention to is the ways that Jesus called people back to the ethic of the Hebrew Bible of uh you know this isn't a new thing that christianity introduced right this was jesus pointing out how to have a more integrated community how to reach out to people who are 
pushed to the margins of society because of who they are. So it, it's really helped me to read that story, John 9, through a Jewish reader's eyes to say, Jesus is sort of calling these people back to an ethic that goes all the way back to Genesis. And as Topher said, uh, this this isn't this Old Testament mean God, New Testament good God. This, this is an ethic that you can find throughout the whole of Scripture that way. Jill Harsha, um, interested in your thoughts. You teach, you lecture in practical theology and disability theology. Uh, please. Yeah, I do. I lecture from a place of experience. And one of the things that strikes me about the John 9 passage is that it wasn't either the man or his parents that asked the question. It was the disciples that asked the question. And I think sometimes that question is imposed from outside. So, for example, when my daughter was born and had very, very significant challenges, which at many times nearly cost her her life, people would say to me, you know, you must wonder why God did this to you. And I went, no, I'm not wondering that at all. And you're asking me to wonder why God knit my child together in my womb to be the person that she was always designed to be with all of the complexities of her disabilities. Why would I be asking that question? And then coincidentally in my family, my husband then uh, was diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis. And so once again, people came and said, well, you really must be wondering this time why God has allowed this to happen. No, we're not wondering. Uh, and then over the last two years, our son has been diagnosed with a degenerative disease, which is not the same disease. And they're clamoring at the door again you must be wondering why. And my question is, why not? You know, we live in the same world. We're all going to struggle. But it's finding the presence and grace of God who is coming towards us with his grace in every moment of every day in the middle of that struggle that is what life is about. And so it concerns me that the question is asked on behalf of my daughter or me or my husband or my son when we're not asking it. So then what are the better questions then? Because that's such a natural question that I think a lot of people feel, you know, it, that question just emerges, right? So part of doing this work, I think, is helping people find better questions. Who, who can speak to that? Uh, Bill Gaventa? Better questions include, Jill, I've seen you with your daughter at church. Can you tell me about your daughter? That's the perfect question, Bill. That's the question that's so rarely asked. And I don't think it's, it's, it's not asked out of uh, unpleasantness. I think in church I've experienced that it's not asked out of fear because people don't want to put their foot in it. People don't want to be insensitive. People don't want to upset you. And yet it's spending many years in churches where that question is never asked. Tell me about your daughter, where she is invisible or avoided that has been the most painful thing and so you asked you know what are the helpful questions the helpful questions are the questions that say tell me about it. I want to get to know her I recognize that she is a member of this community she might not experience it in the same way as other people but her essential humanity and the fact that she was loved into being by God is what makes her part of this community so come and get to know her it's not easy she doesn't talk you can ask her all the questions in the world and she won't speak back to you. You can get right up close in her face and she might push you away. But she's precious and she's worth knowing. And the, the, the time that it will take you to get to know her is God time. It's time spent with God. Neil Cudney, you had something to add? Yeah, I wonder if some of that question isn't answered right in the John 9 text when he says to his disciples, uh, demonstrate the works of God in this person's life. And I wonder if that's one of the questions that we need to be asking, regardless of who it is that we are encountering, is how do we display the works of God in this person's life? Barbara, what are some of the questions you would give people to replace the questions that we've sort of <laughs> tried to tamp down? I'm often struck by the fact that we, as believers, can ask a completely different set of questions to somebody because we have different eyeglasses. We know for sure that your daughter was handmade by God to fill a specific spot in God's kingdom. And so to assume that she brings gifts to this body is a really important thing. So even the first question that I ask you 
uh, about your daughter? What makes her smile? What what does she what does she enjoy? Uh, does she enjoy music? You know, what can we learn about her from a uh, from that perspective of gifts? What gifts does she have, and what does she bring to the body? And I think so often parents, especially, are in a world where there are not believers, and they are told how many degrees below zero, how atypical, how how many percentage points below, uh, and we don't have to start there. We know for sure that this dear child of God brings gifts to the community and we will grow because we are part of that same body together. Katie Steed, I wanted to ask you, how much how much do you think invisible disability becomes a problem? This is where people that might not be familiar with people with disabilities or feel uncomfortable with it, instead of asking the question that, that shouldn't be asked, they might not ask anything at all. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. I think that's a great thing to think about. You know, as, as everyone's talking, you know, I come from this from a professional's perspective, but I also have a nine-year-old son with autism, and it's high-functioning autism. So sometimes it looks like immaturity, or it looks like I didn't do my job right as a mom, is what I feel like. And I can, when I think about reality, I can tell you a question you, you don't ask. I've had people say, tell me what's wrong with David. You know, and I'm like, Hi. That's not very helpful. I think I know what's wrong with you, but we'll keep going, <laughs> you know? And so there's that element of it. Like there must be something wrong here because it doesn't, I, I don't see Down syndrome or I don't see something that I can check a box on. And so what do I do? Also, I think we see often with members that maybe have intense anxiety. And so they want to sit outside of the chapel for church, or maybe they're not coming to church because of anxiety or because of depression. And we have a tendency to think, well, why aren't they just praying more? Why aren't they coming? And we're not being respectful of that is a legitimate disability that they're trying to manage. And so how can we better minister to them? How can we love them like God would love them instead of judging them? You know, if anything we know, we know we're not supposed to be judging and yet we're really, really good at judging people. Muno, you had something to add? Yeah, I come from a tradition that does not give high premium to asking questions, but from sharing and relationality. And from sharing you don't have to ask questions but spontaneously you just get to know each other and by that you connect without even distilling things to uh, questions and answers so it it is very interesting that uh, it is the disciples like uh, was noted who asks the question but jesus simply relates to this and several other people who were in similar or different situations. And through relationships, they began to share. It doesn't have to be him, Jesus asking, or the person asking Jesus, but naturally and spontaneously, one then can, Jesus then comes and says, what can I do for you? And it is the person who actually sets the agenda than of what they need done to them. I'm interested to hear from anyone here who's been to this conference multiple times, and Bill, you might have the answer to this. Is there something you can think of where you heard from someone from a different tradition that turned a light on for you, that made you see something in a different way that you needed to see that, that you, you might not have gotten there without talking to someone from a different tradition? Um, we've had people from many Christian denominations here, a uh, number of Jewish denominations and perspectives as well, and also several Muslim speakers, imams and, and some others, and and some people who would consider themselves to be deeply spiritual and religious but are not connected to a faith tradition. And I think a couple of the Muslim speakers who've been here have been helped me to learn about perspectives in Islam about disability, uh, about their perspective about any kind of human issue is seen as a test in, in that tradition. But oftentimes I think we make real judgments about other faith traditions and make the assumption that they think this, because that's, I've heard this about something else, when in fact that's not what they think, or there's a huge depth to that tradition. I grew up in Africa as well, and if people 
heard Africans the wrong way, they would say, oh, Africa, all Africans believe witchcraft created people with disabilities, which is not the case. You know, there are just multiple kinds of traditions and ways of interpreting that. So it's, I think one of the light bulbs is, wait a minute, there's no one single religious answer in any religious tradition about what disability is or response to it. Katie Steed, you had something to add? So I've come to this conference, I think this is my fourth time that I've attended this conference, and I always come back and I always tell people of my faith, there is something really powerful about being around a group of people that say, I get strength from accessing my higher power, and I want all of the people I know to be able to access that. And it's, yes, we focus on disabilities, but it's really just a group of core people that are saying, I want everybody to know this joy that I know, and I want to be able to make a difference. And I come back rejuvenated every year, just, you know, like we get it, and I, I'm excited to talk with these people. I just, just sitting here right now, I just am loving this conversation. I just want to just keep rehearing this, what we're talking about. This is, this is powerful. This is so powerful, and there's so many questions that sometimes you get caught up in what's happening right here in your own congregation that then to hear these beautiful insights, it's like, it's, it's bigger than us. And it's, and there's a, there's a strength that's bigger than us. And we can, we can build each other with that. Yeah. And you get to see a lot of diversity at the conference in terms of where people are from and ability wise, you get to meet a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I think all of those voices, I, I, there's a strange feeling of home in a place that seems very unfamiliar. At least that's how I experience it. I would say that one of the things this conference does is help make us really question what ability means. Because we see, I think you end up feeling like some of the people we would say might be, by usual terms, the less able have got abilities that we just have come to appreciate and love. To bring things back to something we were discussing a little bit earlier, I would like to explore inclusion a little bit more, to talk about how religious communities can become more inclusive of people with disabilities. Barbara Newman, I know you had some things to say on that. Sometimes I imagine that congregations put up a sign on their door that says, everyone welcome, you'll find a church home here, uh, you know, this is your final family, whatever uh, phrase they may use. And yet I think that sign is often obscured by all of the other signs we tack up uh, on top of that, in front of our worshiping door, in front of our children's ministry door, our youth group door, whatever door that might be. I just see these series of signs, must be able to read, must be able to write, must be able to stand stand, kneel, or sit upon command, must be able to pay sustained attention for at least 30 minutes to an auditory presentation, uh, must be able to read multiple social cues in order to be accepted, must be able to tolerate a variety of fragrances, sounds, and sights. I mean, the list of placards or signs that can cover up that welcome can be huge. And I think inclusion is the effort of the leadership in that church, of every person in that church to say, we're going to tear down those signs so that the sign that is left, it says, everyone welcome. You can find a place where all belong in this place. And I think that that takes, again, a pastor who's willing to perhaps provide some options within that auditory-based message that, that he or she is giving. It, it would take a sound person who's willing to regulate and modulate the sound so that it's not overpowering those that might be ready to cover their ears. It might take an individual who is willing to send some sermon notes ahead of time so that they can be read to that individual on their device as opposed to something that that person needs to read. So I think inclusion and finding those places of belonging, uh, it's the opportunity to say, look, we're going we're gonna to make that basic sign all welcome by coming together as leadership, as congregation, to say, this is our community's effort to make sure everyone can find a place of belonging within this congregation. Sometimes when those signs start to get removed, an attitude crops up, something along the lines of, why do we have to be so sensitive about everything? When I was growing up, such and such. Uh, how do you deal with those types of responses within congregations, sometimes from leadership, sometimes from fellow congregants or fellow worshipers? that attitude of, oh, why do we have to be so sensitive about everything all of a sudden? Attitudes are huge, and they're often one of the biggest signs that covering up the welcome sign. I'll be honest about that. Uh, it's great to make a plan, but 
that plan has to truly include everyone in the congregation. It has to be a value of all of those gathered to say, it's important that we represent the body of Christ in its fullness here. And so I'm going to do my part in order to allow that to happen. And I think the best place to turn for ammunition to that is called scripture. Uh, Scripture is very clear that we need to acknowledge the gifts and the importance of each person. The I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And we need to be well Willing to lay some of those things down, which is also in Scripture. Thank you. Andy Calder, you had something to add. Yes, just in relation to plans and um, inclusion, uh, some years ago we undertook some research in which we asked leaders and people labelled by disability from four traditions, Jewish, Islamic, Buddhist and Christian, about their involvement in faith communities. This is in Victoria, Australia. And the three principles by which we now do our work and our plans came from that research and from those voices and the three principles are that firstly people said they want to get into the place so that takes in the worship space all the social spaces all the physical dimensions whether the doors open yeah Yeah. (laughs) and you can get to the loo as we call the bathrooms the second principle is that they want to be welcomed so that takes in such a range of ways in which people are made to feel welcome or not. And the third principle is that people want to have a say about their involvement. And that goes to the question of being asked, what skills, what contributions, what things would you like to contribute to our community? So they're the three principles by which we're guided in our annual planning for our uh, disability action plan. Christopher, please. Yeah, uh, some of the disability activities in our country ask a question. Who includes who? Who includes who? Who are you to include as? So probably that uh, inclusion has to be seen, uh, you know, from the people with disabilities perspective too. There was a 11-year-old girl was challenging us in one of our meetings. I don't want your wheelchairs. I want space. So probably the inclusion could you know broadly open up our eyes in terms of thinking inclusion from the people with the disabilities perspective i think that's that's crucial there's a a slogan in disability studies nothing about us without us i think a lot of people have heard that yeah shelly there's been a really important sea change in language and this comes about inclusion through the years has has been the buzzword And inclusion has come to mean anything in a faith community. Inclusion simply is equals people with disabilities. We have an inclusion program. We have an inclusion service. It's only for people with disabilities and those who love them, but we have those things. And that somehow then congregations think they're off the hook. So this is inclusion has become one of those things, a checkbox. And it's disturbing because it marginalizes people, it takes away their humanity, and it does nothing to benefit the congregation and all those in it. So when I started to realize all of this so much, that's when I started thinking about belonging. And the conversation needs to shift from inclusion to belonging. And why? Because people in congregation land just don't get it. They don't get the idea that people with disabilities and mental health conditions want what everyone else wants, which is to belong and and whatever that means. And so the idea of belonging then, when you speak with congregations and you ask the leadership, you ask the clergy, you ask the members, you ask the students, you ask the governing bodies, what does it mean to you to belong? Talk about why you're here. What is so important in your relationship with this congregation, with this community? Not even bringing God into the picture at this point, but what is so important to you that you can't live without? What is it that tells you you belong? And once people identify that, then you can start this conversation about the fact that there are so many obstacles for people with disabilities and mental health conditions to belong And that's when the light bulb goes on in people's heads. And then you can start the actions. You can start eliminating those barriers, 
the silos, the obstacles, because now it's not a them and us. It's us and why we all have our own unique ways of belonging in a faith community and contributing and bringing our gifts and sharing and receiving comfort and all those things. Those are all indicators of belonging. So it's not inclusion so much. It's belonging. Yeah, and I think the difference is sort of inclusion is supplementary, right? Inclusion is sort of tacked on to something. Uh, mm -hmm. A truly accessible worship space would be one where everyone can can be there and belong together. Not not everyone, oh, and then we also do this thing. Right. Uh, everything can be just as uh, embracing. Uh, right. Jill Harshaw, you had something to add. Yeah, what Shelley's been saying and writing chimes with me so much, uh, especially around this kind of construct of inclusion and belonging. And and when I was coming here and I'd read your book, Shelley, um, I was thinking about that that so much. But I looked at that word belong, you know, and you can you can find in its root that to belong is to be longed for, and we already belong because God longs for us. We are the object of his longing. And so how that relates to me with the issue of inclusion is inclusion is like something where we, we hand out and say, oh, do come in. We'll try and make it nice for you. Actually, these people belong. It's not our role to include them because God has already given them a place of belonging. And in actual fact, if we're not living as that place where they and we, and I hate saying they and we, but that's what we're talking about, where everyone belongs because they are longed for by God, then that's not church at all. And so it's not about us including them. It's about sometimes we need to realize that we're not who we say we are if other people aren't there. Muno, you had something you wanted to add. Yes. From my context of Zimbabwe and African culture, there is a sense in which in terms of inclusion, we need to find spaces where we go against the grain. Sometimes the people who have been oppressed for a long time or have been marginalized for a long time tend to think that what they are going through is normal. And for them to be able to set the agenda it becomes extremely difficult. I'll give you an example. In many situations, particularly people associate parents who have children with disabilities with a, a kind of dabbling in some magic that makes them rich and then they are assumed or are perceived to be using their children to be able to get where they are. This is the whole myths and perceptions that go with albinism, for example. That if you have some body parts of an albino, you are likely to achieve this or that. Now, given such an environment, I think even our churches, which are, whose psyche is informed by African traditional religious mindset, they need somebody who is able to stand up and confront those um, structures or perceptions that are now seen as commonsensical and say, hey, this is what people think, but this is not how things are. Even successful ministers of the gospel, if you become successful and if a big church and your church does not have conflict and for some reason there is someone with a mental disability who comes to your church, people think that that's your charm for success in ministry as it were. So there is a sense in which we need people who are very revolutionary and who do not wait for people to get where they are, but who will then say, this is what I think and I'm happy to put my head on the guillotine block uh, and this is what I believe. Who knows? Uh, in no time, people will then see, in my culture, we, we have uh, this saying, proverbial saying, which says that um, the puppies, uh, I mean the, the young ones of a dog, they do not see or they do not open their eyes the same day, even if they were born the same day. So some will be able to see on the third day, some will be able to see on the seventh day, but the point is that they will all see someday. Thank you. 
so to kind of summarize, I think, uh, the things that we've talked about in terms of increasing the belonging in our congregations, we heard about confronting attitudes, and, and sometimes that takes courage, and you have to sort of confront very deeply rooted attitudes, uh, and that happens in, in every context, whether it be in Africa with, you know, in the United States, I don't encounter the witchcrafting, but I do encounter the idea that someone may have sinned and caused a disability, or that a person is disabled and in order to teach me something, which turns them into a tool and, and, and kind of erases their experience. So confronting attitudes, that's uh, one thing. Secondly, removing barriers and taking down the signs that say you're not welcome here. And that can be everything from having doors that open for people in, in wheelchairs or um, uh, having youth groups that have appropriate activities that can cater to as many different children as possible. So getting rid of those barriers. And then lastly, to listen to people with disabilities, value their voices, value their experiences, and find out how the congregation or how the synagogue or how the group can do better at accommodating and, and at helping them feel welcome. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is gifts. And the reason I want to talk about gifts is because one of the purposes of the summer seminar uh, here is to focus on the gifts that people with disabilities themselves offer to religious communities, the gifts that people with disabilities offer to theology itself. And, and these are disabilities, whether they're chronic conditions, whether they're lifelong disabilities, whether it's something that comes along with aging or something that a disability can affect us at any point in our lives. So I want to talk about the gifts that people with disabilities can offer. And Jill, I wanted to begin with you because before we started recording, we had an interesting discussion about some uh, kind of a caution about talking about gifts. Please. Yeah, I feel there's been a movement in disability theology, in particular in intellectual disability theology, which is on a journey. But I fear that at some point we got a little bit stuck around this gift issue uh, in the sense that we began to look for ways to understand people with, particularly with profound intellectual disabilities, as human beings made in the image of God and, and as people who, as part of that, as people who need to contribute something. And so we started looking for what they could bring to us. And part of that was about how they reveal things to us, about being human, particularly issues of vulnerability, invite us to embrace our own vulnerability. And those kind of things became kind of the mantras around that idea of gift. And I felt there was a danger of us objectifying people by basically saying, oh, now I've found out why you're worth something, because you've taught me something. And actually, you're worth something because you are. You are because God made you to be and loved you to be. Uh, and, and whether you never tell me anything, that doesn't matter. You still are. But one of the examples that comes out of that is that issue of vulnerability, because those of us who are generally able-bodied love to talk about how, you know, my daughter shows me what it's like to be vulnerable. Well, it is no picnic to be vulnerable if you're in my daughter's position. And idealizing it or looking at it through rose-tinted spectacles, if you are for example, in an institution where you cannot speak for yourself, where it, there is potential abuse going on and you are defenseless, vulnerability is no bed of roses. And so I think the danger of it is idealizing the experience of someone uh, because that helps me to embrace my vulnerability. My vulnerability and my daughter's just aren't the same. And the other thing people might do that I've heard as well is to say, aren't you such a special mother? Oh, Isn't this so that's wonderful? My, that's my absolute hate. The, the superhero mom, you know, uh, God only sends him to special people. Uh, you know, I don't know how you get the strength to do it. That what someone called super arrogation, where suddenly someone who's just loving their child becomes a hero. Not only does it put pressure on parents, one of the things that was least helpful for, to me in the beginning was whenever uh, Rebecca was diagnosed with many complex issues, a pastor gave me a book that was written by a woman whose child also had many complex issues, and it was this wonderful spiritual story of triumph in the face of all of this, and all I felt was more burdened. So we need to be really careful around the language that we use. And yes, we need to be acknowledging and helping people to uncover their gifts, but not to impose a function along with that gift. My, my daughter is a gift by being Rebecca. Thank you. Devin Stahl, uh, 
you had something to add to this. Now that we kind of have that caveat, now what we say, hopefully, this is where it gets tricky, is keeping that in mind while we talk about some of the gifts that people with disabilities bring to our community. Devin Stahl, please. I think that was so well articulated, Joe. And I think what I was going to say feeds right off of that is all of our lives are a gift. I mean, we we might bring gifts to the community. It's hard to get out of a market-based economy idea where I bring things and get things and I'm productive and I help in that way. But our lives are gifts. So we are a gift to ourselves and to one another because our lives were not created by ourselves, by a, by a good God who gives us that life. And so instead of thinking of the particular gifts that I'm going to sort of en- enact or get out of you, our, all of our lives are a gift. And remembering that, the giftedness of that, the promise of that, I think doesn't try to do away with our differences, but recognizes that we, we share that in common. All of our lives are, are this gift. And I think that that helps to sort of uh, maybe prevent some of the, the talk that, that you've heard. Thank you. Katie Steed, you had something you wanted to add. Yes. So two thoughts on that. One, I think something that really frustrates me in this arena is when we make it like newsworthy that, oh, the football jock at the high school is taking the girl with Down syndrome to prom. And it's literally news on the news. (laughs) And I think, why? Why is that any more? He took his friend to prom. Great. Why does it matter? Why do we want to pat ourselves on the back for these these things? And so this kind of this mascot mentality, or may I feel good because I took this person with these special needs. You took your friend to a, a, th- a social thing. Great. That's wonderful. And then also, I think another thing that I would add with this parenting thing of, oh, you're, you're such a, you know, God only chooses the special moms to get these special children. I think another big thing that it puts on a mother's shoulders that she's already really good at putting on her shoulders so she doesn't need any more is guilt. And it's like the highest guilt you can give because it's God guilt, right? Like, oh, God gave me this and then I'm still failing at it. And so it's, these are not helpful things. I think we're all a gift, right? I have three children and to isolate David as any more important or any more special or God sent him as if he was more important to come to me than my other two children to come to me. You know, it creates a complexity, it creates guilt, and it creates confusion in a mother that's already exhausted and trying to just figure out life. And I think there's a lot better ways we can address that. Thank you. Topher, did you have something to add? Um, I think following in line with what's just been said is often when we think about gifting and burden with regard to disability, we individualize it so much that we can't help but be problematic about it. And I think one of the not gifts of disability itself, but gifts of this discourse that we have available to us is that it reminds us that we exist um, as a people in a society and in a community that can't be divorced into all of these in particular individual bubbles that don't intersect and don't interact, but that we all play a role in constructing one another and that there's a giftedness to each of our identities and each of our lives But there's also a giftedness to playing a role in the community itself, knowing that the community would be something radically different if every single person who's there wasn't there. If any one of them was gone, it would be a new and different thing. Um, And so for us to be able to say, every person who is here in this community, whether they're contributing or not, just by their presence has changed it. And it's something different and better because of this. Uh, We don't have to put a market value on that. And we can't, in fact. And I mean, I think that's a particularly loaded political and social statement to make, um, which maybe would be a focus of another podcast at a different time. (laughs) But there is something beautiful about acknowledging the, the duality of being an individual, but also not stopping at the edge of your body, but letting that space sort of be between and betwixt. Yeah, to take it back to Genesis again, God created variety, and that variety exists in community. And growing up in the United States, I definitely had this hyper-individualistic mentality that I, uh, I can pull myself up by my bootstraps and that I can be an independent person. And, and I think that led me to overlook how deeply woven into community 
I really was and still am. And one thing that getting to know people with disabilities better and, and getting to know disability studies better has done for me is to plug me into the interdependence that we have. And not in a way that makes someone having a disability for my own benefit, like God made them that way so our community could be better. But that's just how our community is. And, 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 it, and the shape that it takes is made up of the people that are in it. So I appreciate that. Shelly, did you have a thought? I do. And this was an epiphany. This was a pivotal moment as my son's mother. I had had a particularly horrible confrontation with the assistant principal in his middle school. He was 14 years old. He had become a bar mitzvah the previous year. He the, our lives in our synagogue were seamless. Jake was just Jake. And just like our other kids were just who they were. And I had a particularly horrible phone call with the assistant principal one day from his public school. And it was so bad. It was so bad. I bullied this man. I was so angry because he called to tell me he was giving Jacob in school suspension for poking a hole in a concrete wall with a pencil. It was absurd, and it just, I, I just blew. I pulled the law into my phone call, and I let this guy just, ugh, I bullied him. I got a standing ovation from my colleagues in my office that day, too, and I was pretty proud until I realized, what did I just do? You know, this is, we have to play this game. This is horrible. Why can't they just see our son as another student who maybe needs supports and and P.S. who's watching him so closely to see that he's poking holes in concrete walls with anything. And that night, I went in to say goodnight to Jake, and I was still really shaken up, and I was still so angry. And I, I he was sleeping. And I said, God, why me? Why my child? Why? Why do we have to go through this? And I stopped, and I looked at Jake again. And I realized I, that wasn't the question. That was not the question. And I realized that God was as angry with all of these horrible things that took away Jacob's humanity, deprived him of the rights of being human. God was just as angry as I was. And I realized at that point that God and I were partners with Jake, with Jake to teach his teachers, to teach the society, to teach the world that Jake and other people who live with things that we label are human like anybody else. And, and that was the most powerful statement. And I felt so reassured to know that God and I were on the same team. And that just changed, it changed everything changed everything in, in how I saw things. It changed how I talk about this and write about this now. Muno, uh, we're talking here about gifts. Please, uh, like to hear from you. I think uh, the subject of gifts uh, is quite uh, revealing, particularly with regards to those people who have unique experiences with disability. There are certain expectations that they have from uh, the society, particularly from the church. Sometimes uh, people can do certain things sincerely or with sincerity without knowing that they are wounding or further causing wounds to people who are already wounded. And the reaction and the response uh, is very traumatic and traumatizing. Uh, it can be on both sides. So there is a, an extent to which I think we need to be gracious with each other because the, every other person is a product of their own experiences, limitedness, and some people can be sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong. And if we give room for grace, it will be able to ensure that um, we can still be angry, which is normal and human, but still leave room for accommodating each other in spite of our weaknesses and strength. 
Yeah, I think that's a good reminder. Uh, sometimes these kind of conversations might make people freeze and, and feel like they don't want to maybe do anything because they don't want to do something wrong. And I think people in this group here want the opposite of that and, and with a recognition that there will be some grace needed uh, yeah. when people make mistakes or when things don't go as we like them to go. So we don't want people to be afraid and, and to freeze up. We need to give each other space. I think that's an important reminder. Christopher, please. The ableist community talk about the special gifts. I think and I do personally feel that let the ableist community not spiritualize or romanticize the disability. Disability is a reality. Disability to be seen as disability and a reality. Not necessarily to romanticize by saying that there are special gifts and the gifts are to be used and so on. Probably in some cases it might work, in many cases it might not work. Again, let us let the ableist community not try to pacify or you know try to uh, bring kind of a disparity over you know these things. Let us accept disability as a reality. Let us stand on it. The tendency is to alleviate my own anxiety. Uh, by explaining a disability or by putting a person with a disability in a particular box that kind of I can account for them and or I can serve them or they do something for me. But do I do that with everybody in my life? I, I really don't. And so the trick is to learn how to interact with people of all different kinds of abilities without that extra effort required, without, you know, just treating them as a fellow human being. I, exactly. I appreciate that a lot. We'll, we'll conclude with Andy Calder, please. Um, I really come back to what Jill was saying before that <clears throat> people are there by the grace of God and um, in terms of gifts that it is their very presence that is the gift and, it, uh, and I think that applies to all of us. Um, one of the, the yardsticks if you like that I've heard used as a phrase and have used it on a, the report that I referred to earlier in terms of those three principles that people said about being part of a faith community is the phrase, to belong, I need to be missed. To belong, I need to be missed. And for me, that speaks volumes for what giftedness is about. Whatever it is we bring, we're all contributing to that sense of belonging and the love that a community can create around all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We were joined by a special panel here at the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability in Holland, Michigan. I appreciate all the panelists who took time out of their schedules to talk about these issues. You can learn more about each panelist on our website, mi.byu.edu. We'll have profiles and a photo of each of the guests to help you keep them straight. We appreciate you listening to this episode, and we'll see you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.